and she instantly meets the microphone on and she has the idea and it and it slips sometimes she goes oh, i but if she doesn't have that moment and she's so clear and she does it so perfectly on the first take it's a, it's an extraordinary I, mean, I don't know how to say it i mean it's like a freak of nature oh. that, you know you've got a singer that actually has never heard a piece of music I, and I sings think, it perfectly yeah, on the first I think take. it's a freak of nature yeah yeah yeah. It's gone. Yeah, no, no. I think all singers can do this. It's just that they're expected to work extremely hard to prove, but they already know. It's just that they're like, oh, well, can you do it like this? Can you sing it that? Can you do it that way? Just let them sing. Mm. Don't worry about whether it's in tune or out of tune or on time. Or, you can fix all that later. Yeah. Just get that moment in time where they're allowed to feel safe and if someone if a composer can make you feel safe yeah, yeah. so much so that you can walk in and you can connect immediately or within a couple of takes then that's where you want to be as a singer yeah, you don't want to be in a place where they put you in a studio and it's like it's all set up and everyone's waiting there and it's like well okay you can sing now <laughs> and then oh okay uh and then, oh, can you do, instead of that bit, can you make that bit go up there? Or can you have absolutely no idea what it is to connect with the, I don't want to use the word umbilical cord because it's a too, too sort of um, physical, but it's you connect. And once you unlock that, there's nothing more to do. Absolutely. You can stand there all day. Just trust your singers. I mean, I say to people, trust your singers. Don't. You know, I mean, that's one thing when I'm working with Hans. I hope you don't mind me mentioning that to you. Absolutely. But not. he's the same. He won't let it's me brilliant. hear the piece. He won't let me hear the piece before I go in because he knows that it's that deadly moment, that absolutely deadly moment where you've got nowhere to run. There's nowhere to hide. There's nowhere to think. <laughs> you just have to do it. Absolutely. And that's. That's being a singer is this when you think about it, you know, and there's other ways of, of understanding singing and music too. That you know, when people are in foxholes and there's a bomb coming and they, they hold each other and they either pray or they sing and they combine their energies in that, don't they? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, the interesting thing is the way that I that I personally work is that. Lisa obviously knows that I'm very meticulous and have a very clear vision of what I want. But when I work with other people, I'm inviting them or or we're both inviting each other. To work. So I want the other person to do what they do. I, I, I you know, and I'm not trying to criticize or, or put down any other artists, but I, I worked with other artists that are absolute control freaks where they they don't allow that space for other artists. If I'm bringing another artist that I'm going to work with, a cellist or a violinist or a guitar player, or whatever, you know, many times I've done sessions where I'll be there for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, and I'm like, okay, thank you. And they're like, are we done? I'm like, yeah. They're like, you know, they're there to do what they do. So you, you get to a point as an artist that you've done enough and you've expressed yourself enough where you, you allow yourself that space to say, I don't want it to be all about me. It's yeah. not about me. It's about the work. It's about the honesty and the truth behind the work. Absolutely, yeah. I think Lisa and I yeah. are very compatible because she knows for a fact that we may have diff you know, um, differences of, 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 of opinions, but those differences of opinions are always based on our passion and our, our commitment to the truth of the work that we're doing. It's not ego-based. It's not about me getting, you know, my moment of my my spotlight moment it's not about that it's about the truth of the work and there's been many times where she has denied an idea that i had and then i discovered you know what she was right you know it was she was following a truth that that i got to see later down the road and i, I recognized you know what because it's about that it's about the truth we're, we're, we're almost like and i always say we're almost like scientists we're looking for this thing that we keep polishing and polishing and polishing over and over and over again with this desire to make it better because we have this idea that that we want to manifest and yet it, it never truly manifests it's almost always there you know i listen to these albums and i'm totally on board and committed and convinced and a few weeks go by and I go back and I go, no, there's 
what I thought I had put down is not truly there yet. What I what I was what I wanted to put down, it's still in the ether, and I still have to keep trying to do that. And Lisa's very much that same way. And so Ooh, that indeed. search, that ether that we're continuously searching for. It's not about the money. It's not about the fame. It's not about the awards. It's not about walking down the red carpet. I couldn't care less about any of that. It's mm. about capturing that one instance of reality that's continuously escaping from your hands. You absolutely. Know? Yeah. Let, let, as, as, yeah, absolutely. Let, let's go back to the beginning of the album because you were living in Los Angeles and Lisa was in Melbourne. How how you guys put that together? Well, obviously over the internet, sending file back and forth, but... Every time I have a chance, Lisa can testify to this, I try to have her in the room singing, you know. Every time I have a chance. I mean, I would literally just put, you know, a, a, a bed bunk in the studio and I would be <laughs> always... You know, I would live there with Lisa if I could, because every, you know, she says I'm a nightmare because I want to put her voice in everything. But I love her writing. It's not just her voice. It's her writing as a composer. So um, in that regard, I'm a, I'm a huge fan. So we had, you know, she'd be coming in and out of Los Angeles to work on films uh, with me. I had a studio set up there where we were working out of. And and so every so often in between projects, when she would arrive, I might have a piece of music and she would come and sit on the couch and we'd start talking. You know, we really get along intellectually. I'm, I'm always fascinated with, you know, because Lisa's not just a singer artist. She's so well versed in poetry and literature. She has such refined tastes. And I resonate with that because I lived all over the world and, and I went, you know, I lived in Europe and we also lived in Spain. Um, so we have a lot of things in common. So we'll sit in the studio and I'll play her something and she'll get an idea and she'll record it. And then, and then we'll end up working on a film and those pieces will kind of get buried in the, in the hard drives. And so I always keep a very organized way of keeping all those things together. And so when Exaudia happened was that I had written this piece inspired by Sephardic music and and i sent it to her and she loved it and i was very grateful that she wanted to spend some time working on it and i had a few pieces that as a result of what i just explained had in the in in our banks and with a little bit of effort i thought you know what if you can sing on these pieces and we can do this we've got an album Absolutely. and so i started recording a lot of live instruments in the studio and developing them and then she sang on them and some of the pieces I would write, and then I would I would discover that you know what this is a great piece by itself, in my opinion. Um, mm -hmm. But now that she sent me vocals, her writing from a, from a musical standpoint, I wanted to completely rearchitecturalize the piece to spotlight some of the great writing she had done vocally. So it was like I want to give now a spotlight to and and, and bring those vocals musically. And, and, and frame them in their own light within these pieces so that people can actually acknowledge and, 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 and rejoice and, and, and enjoy not just the piece for what it is, but now it deserves to be rewritten because she's written such amazing passages that I love those passages by themselves. And I want the listener to really, you know, um, bask in the beauty of the work that she does. So these pieces, they start out as this, this piece and, you know, and I'm grateful that she loves her work and she resonates with them. But once she sings on them, it's mm -hmm. like, you know what? No, this deserves to be rewritten and to showcase just the beauty that she's brought into this piece by itself, you know, and, and, and make it work and, and dance with the piece as a, as a full composition. So absolutely. We uh, no, absolutely. Lisa, it's a question for you. You you think in, in, in very interesting ways, as if you're creating your own vocabulary, uh, your own language, obviously, it's not English. Sometimes in English, sometimes it is in English. But are you are you conscious when you are thinking, or or you have an idea, you have a painting in front of you? Forget about the story. You have a painting. You read. You read uh, Pablo Neruda, or you saw a painting from Picasso, and then you start words start coming out of your, your mouth. How how you how you manage that? It's not academic at all. It's just automatic. It's automatic. And it's usually to do with, say, for instance, Marcello wrote a piece of music that I sang to the other day that sounded South American. Really? So to unlock that piece, there are these funiculars that exist within the sort of the, the shapes and the colours of the guitars that are part of the, the, that language. 
So it always, it is interesting because I had a neurologist say to me once, how can you sing that language from a piece that you wrote when you were 19 years old and it's still the same kind of vernacular and yet when you sing this piece, it's another vernacular. It's almost like the languages are innate within the music itself. So I'm just interpreting what's already there. Do you understand? Yeah, yeah. So it's all a response to what is real. Yeah. It's, um, I remember... I yeah, go ahead. I mean, I, I can't explain it to you. All I know is that if when I heard that South American piece, or a piece that sounded like it, it had some kind of feeling from... Peru, probably. Yeah, probably Peru. The Andes. Yeah, it yeah. had that feeling about it. And the language is already invoked by the music that's there, and it's it's automatic. And I think all singers can do this. I think they just have to be allowed. And don't think. Listen. Stop thinking and just listen. It's already there. You know, that's the one thing. When I work with singers, and I do sometimes, I do some master classes, and the thing that the hardest thing to do is to get them to stop thinking. Just feel it. Just make a noise and follow the noise and, uh, you know, let it overwhelm you, even if it's only two or three notes. I'm telling you, I've been in rooms with people where it's like you say, well, who'd like to have a go first at singing a note? You know, it might just be more, what, how do you just, what's your first note? Mm, that's the one you're comfortable with, right? Yeah. So what do we do with that? Where do we go with this one? And no one wants to. And I'm like, hands up, who wants to sort of go first? And no one puts a hand up. Do you know, within 15 minutes, you can't shut them up. <laughs> and it's like, you have to say, you know, can Jane have a turn, please? <laughs> it's like, because, you know, uh, William is suddenly... You know, he's off and he's racing. And it's like, and then when you get them working together, where even though it's not in unison, the fact that they are creating this wonderful, this wonderful um, sort of cyclone of gentle tonics together, that, and they combine and they fall into, and they're, it's so therapeutic. And, you know, the one thing that I always find when we do this work together, you never know when to stop. You never know, how do I end this? How do I say, okay, that's enough, guys, because you can't. But somebody will start laughing <laughs> and everybody really? starts laughing. And you know, and it can be five minutes or it can be 20 minutes, but once that person goes, <laughs> everybody falls into that laughter and that's the end of the composition. It's extraordinary, and it's such a wonderful healing way of exiting this communal positive uni unification of all these voices falling in and around each other. It's it's wonderful, and that's probably the most primal part of what music is. It's that where we all join in, free, in frequencies. Because you know that when you play music in a theatre, Every room you play that piece in, every room you sing that piece in is going to depend on the electricity of the people that are present, how mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it, it's different every time. Like you can play in Chile and everyone, but the minute you walk on stage, everyone's on the air like, oh, my God, you know. <laughs> and yeah, they're right. absolutely excited. And then you can go the very next stage, Germany, and everyone's so reverent. That's and right. it's like, of course, you know, you're dealing with a completely different frequency. And it's not to say one is more important than the other, but of course yeah. it's going to affect the connection and the and the and the performance. Yeah. People in Latin America, as you know, right? So they are they're very expressive and they they tell you, they applaud in between yeah. tracks as well. And they, you on the other hand, you are receiving all that warm and uh effect from people. It's so must feel important. amazing to you know, oh, to right. feel that way. Yeah. It's, you know, it's food, and you realize it's so important that we're together at that moment. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Where, where, where does the, the motivation come from, from the two of you coming from different parts of the world to keep on working together and keep on working together? And, you know, you go away, and then Lisa does, she, 
her own thing and they hey lisa i have an idea can we get together next week or whatever but where where does the, mot the, the motivation the tenacity to keep on working truth that we we always talk about is that truth that keeps nagging at us telling us you know what like she said you know sometimes you say oh i'll never do this again but then that truth keeps nagging at you and you go you know you find these 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 creative soulmates for a lack of a better word um mm -hmm. you know that you that's a wonderful description that you can that you can that you say with this with this person i can bring this work forward yes i can do and that's what i was talking about earlier is that when i first started out i wanted to express all this you know you're you're a young artist and you have all these ideas you want to express and then you do if you if you're lucky enough and you push hard enough and you work hard enough you'll get the opportunity to to do it but then there's a moment where you realize that there's a lot more there's a lot more to create in in the spirit of collaboration Mm -hmm. Just like what Lisa was talking about, when all these groups of people get together with vocals, and that's another thing I want to address too. When I work with Lisa's vocals, and I create, and I can create choirs with her vocals, mm -hmm. the vibration that comes out of that is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. And so you find these people that you create with that you know, yeah, you, you can do it on your own, absolutely. But when you're with those people, you're better. You know, when you when you when you humble yourself, mm -hmm. and you and these people come into your space and. You're open to creating with other people. You realize that the work gets better. Absolutely. And so that's what's so dangerous. About. There's a danger in collaborating that you don't have when you work alone. It's very safe when you work alone. Yeah. You can organize and you can strategize, you know, have strategies on how you're going to approach this, that, and the other. But there's a, a definite danger when yeah. there's a collaboration because you can't. It's exciting from the point of view that you can't possibly know what that person's going to create. Yeah, and how you're going to respond to their creation. But it's also it's also that aspect of being artists and being on the edge, you know. Are you yes, right, yeah. You know, the truth itself that you're looking for through your work is what pushes you to take those chances and to say, you know what, I'm gonna put I'm not gonna be in the comfort zone all the time. You know, I've already been in the comfort zone a long enough right, that yeah. I wanna have time to get on the edge and see what happens and see what comes out of it you know you know fly across the world and maybe work in an environment that you're not comfortable or you're not necessarily uncomfortable in but that it's completely new and foreign to you what are you going to what's going to happen as a result what results are you going to get as a result of putting yourself in a position like that mm -hmm. you know and 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 that that's that's the challenge and that's the beauty of being an artist absolutely yeah. take taking risks and getting out of your comfort zone is the only way to accomplish anything in life uh, if you think about it, you know, being being art, being an engineer, being a musician, being a painter, whatever that is, it's uh, you need to feel uncomfortable. And, yeah, and it's sometimes you go through those times, and then you look back and and you realize there were some of the most extraordinary moments of your life when you were uncomfortable. Yeah, you know? absolutely. You know? the, so, the, 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 the music, the music. Uh, when every time that I listen to, I suppose, Death Can Dance or your music, Marcelo, or or uh, Exaudia, it's very melancholic, at least for me, for who I am. It it does affect you, you the performance, when singing melancholic tune or, or working a melancholic track um, with your own reality. How you balance, you know, the melancholic world versus the you uh, as the person. Day to day, yeah, it's 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 sometimes you know sometimes you realize that that when you're going through to write some of the greatest pieces of music have been melancholic. That's right. Music. And so artists deal with that level of depression that they go into. They have to dive into to create and then come out of it. It's it's a, it's complicated. It's really complicated. As yeah, you can because see, you're unlocking pain fields, aren't yeah, you? I mean, yeah. it's not you're not just unlocking. You know, it's not like happy 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 you have to open up all of the the pathways that are your experience and and many of them many of your experiences that come out during song forms or musical forms are painful mm -hmm. you know it's 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 almost like a panacea in a way but it, the, the fascinating thing is is that humans tend to react to those works more than happy 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 you know i mean you, re, you you listen to a piece when you listen to, for example, Mercedes Sosa, or you listen to, you know, some of these 
pieces of music, and, and it's usually the melancholic ones that tend to touch people the most. Absolutely. For some, yeah. for some reason. You know, especially in our culture, you know, in South America, you know, with mm. all the very some of the music's very melancholic. It's you know, and and, and it's and poetic, you know, when you read, you know, some of the writers as well, you know, the stories are tragic, yet it, it brings such such attention from the public, you know. Mm. It touches it touches the public a lot more, you know. Yeah. And if you for for instance, if you have seen or read some of the comments from some of the tracks from Saudi and YouTube, and people will say, people are very open with this. I will say, I just lost my job, or my son or daughter was in a hospital, or my dad passed away, whatever. And then this particular track brings me a lot of hope. I cry a lot, but I'm, I'm seeing life from a different perspective and so on and so forth. You know, I, it, it's amazing what like your type of music does for people. Music that does that, though. I mean, I know we've all experienced great loss and death and yeah. remembering love affair or something. They're the things that mold you. I remember when my brother died and I had seen lots of Juan Miro paintings and I sort of didn't really, I thought they were nice. I thought they were interesting. But when my brother died, I was exposed, my senses were so exposed Mm. That when I saw those, I saw this painting, the lovers of all these strings and wheels, and I completely understood it. Mm. And that's something that we have this crust that grows over us that's called ignorance. And it happens to us from when we're a very early age. And as we get older, we get harder and harder crusts. And mm. the things that take that crust away are things like music so that we can experience something in a deeper way, whether it's not not even the music itself, but a memory or or a, the fact that we've lost a, a, a loved one and, and that it allows our crust to fall off us, our ignorance to fall off us, mm. you know. And that's that's the thing that these things do is that because we are forced, we we have to be so so tough in life, you know. We have to be able to wake up in the morning and face a whole new day with a whole lot of issues that need to be addressed mm -hmm. that aren't necessarily comfortable. But mm -hmm. then, and so we build up these shields and barriers. Mm -hmm. But it's things like the arts. And when Marcello was saying earlier about how music, you know, when people, they're, they're in contact with music, they cry or, or the, the melancholia, you know, that those things, those shields fall down. And in a way for us to remain healthy emotionally, we have to have those shields come down. Absolutely. Otherwise, yeah. what are, we're not making decisions based on sensitivity. We're making Absolutely. them based yeah. on our crusty, ignorant, self-serving selves. So yeah. we have to keep our role as musicians, We, we our role as artists, I believe, is that we keep each other sensitive. Yeah, right. It, it's sort of, if we bring it to a psychological level, right, in Carl Gustav Jung terms, right, we build a persona, we bring walls, and then all of a sudden, in your case, your brother passed away or my dad passed away, and you take the mask in front of you, right, and then you you let the emotion come to you, and there you are, you cry, you can express yourself, or, you know. Well, I, I think what music does really, it's, like Lisa's talking about the crust, you know. Um, I've seen it in people that have become much older and they, they've suffered a lot, a lot. All of a sudden, they listen to a piece of music. What happens is, is that the music allows them to revisit that moment in a very safe space. Yeah. You know, they, they experience that music in a very personal, safe space. The music goes through them. And in that very safe space, they get to experience that, that secret memory that they, that they have that they don't want to relinquish to you know, as a result of being fragile. And they can be fragile in that moment with that piece of music. And the music allows that space to happen. You know, you, you know, it, you could say it's the music or you could say it's it's an avenue for that person to experience that memory, that moment in the in the most fragile sense, in the most private sense, you know. And so that's that's what 
music really allows you to experience it. Exactly. It's a private world. Yeah. And you also have to remember that, you know, the old Cadillac that we walk around in, you know, this car that we're in, this fleshy vehicle, rots yeah. in the ground. So we better, you know, exercise some greater soul tissue dimension, whether it be spiritual or whatever. I don't think music is spiritual. I think it's it's a soulful experience. But Absolutely. if we're not if we're not evolving in those areas, when that thing goes into the ground, what are we left with? Mm. You know, we worked hard in the factory building pipes. Great. Okay. You know, it's, I don't know, I just think that these are the things, these properties have been in a way given to us in the human context of keeping the very thing alive that lives on after the rest is gone yep. in some way. It agitates that. Anyway, I've had enough. Yeah, anyway, be, one, <laughs> one last thing we want to do is we want to actually, we'd like oh, yes, to, we have to say, say, a, say thank you. We want to say a very, very special thank you to you, Claudio. You've been thank a, you, an Claudio. amazing person. Uh, you've supported us. So we want to thank you, and we also want to thank Christian Conti. Can you say that? Christian? Thank you, Christian Conti. Thank for all your you. help. Muchas gracias. For, for, the, for the fan group and all support you've given to Exavia. Thank yep. you. Thank and, you. And, and the last question, I need to ask you that. So you just finished the, the tour with uh, Jules, the burn. You're working with uh, Hans Zimmer now. Is there a possibility to uh, bring uh, this beautiful album on Exavia? on a stage and probably tour down the road? Is there a possibility? Yeah, that's our dream. We want to do this, but we need to find out how we can do this because it's it's tricky, you know, because it always comes back to currency. You know, it always comes back to people taking risks and money and, and et cetera, and it's a tricky yeah. one. But we're, we're looking into this and we hope to do this. We would love to, wouldn't we? Absolutely. We really Absolutely. want to because that's the time when you really get to commune with the people that have been touched by the work. And it's it's so important. Absolutely. Otherwise, it becomes a very lonely experience. And we don't want it to be lonely. We want yeah. to share it. Well, let me know so if what, I can do anything from, from my end here, because I would love that to. I'm a very stubborn person. I will not stop nagging the two of you until I see you from, <laughs> from stage. We, we invite nagging. We invite you to keep nagging. We like your nagging. Yeah, yeah. I will. I will. Yeah. Yeah, you can come I... to my masterclasses and nag your head off all day long. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Ali. It was very nice talking to you. Thank you very much, Lisa, okay. and thank you very much, uh, Marcelo. It was very nice talking to you and impromptu. And it was good. Keep on working hard. Keep on accomplishing great things. Good luck with the Hans Zimmer tour, uh, Lisa. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be in London. Um, seeing you the June 14 and 15. In London, so oh, um, well, let me know. do you have tickets? Because I always get a couple of tickets that I'm allowed to have for the concerts. So. Oh, if you oh that that would be great if you no so I don't have tickets. We can yeah maybe you guys can connect in London or something you know yeah that would be great and good luck to you, uh, Marcelo. When are you flying back to United States tomorrow or? Yana tomorrow. Oh well tomorrow. yeah all right. Well good luck to you, man. It was nice talking to you and hopefully we'll. Share a meal or a glass of wine or a beer, whatever, next next time around in London, maybe, when I see you. All right, you take care now. Bye Thank bye. you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.